Well, good morning. It is good to be here with you this morning. My name is Vance, and I am the, um, the junior high pastor here. And uh, if you are new this morning, we're glad to see you. If you've been here for a while, we're glad to see you too. Don't take that the wrong way. Um, but for all of you, you may notice in the seat backs in front of you, there's these little uh, cards, like prayer cards. Um, and it's, it is for prayer, obviously, but it's even more than that. At the bottom, there's a little QR code that you can scan that will just give you ways to connect here at the church. It'll give you ways to find out what's going on. Um, and if you feel that, it'll also give you ways to, um, to give to the church electronically. That is all on that little QR code. Um, now, this morning, we are continuing a series that we are doing called Redeeming Time. And it's this idea of, of like, kind of what would it look like to reorient, reorient our lives to God's time, to, like, God's calendar instead of, like, our school calendar or our work calendar or just our busy life calendar, but to actually reorient life to God's calendar, to his schedule. Um, and as we do that, we are currently in this season of Advent, which is a a season set aside to spiritually prepare for the coming of Christ and to just kind of a, a, a space to just wait, this expectancy of his coming. Um, and, and we're actually in the third week of that series. And, and on this week, we actually get to kind of pause and remember the shepherds. Um, the shepherds were the, the ordinary guys who were out in the field day and night taking care of the sheep, watching over them. But they were also the people that God chose to go to first to reveal the birth of Christ. They were also the first ones to actually go and see the baby Jesus. They were the first ones to bow and worship Christ. And they were the first ones to go and spread the good news of Christ by running back into town and telling everyone that they saw. Uh, in Luke, if we look in... In Luke 2, 8 to 11, it says, And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And on this third Sunday of Advent, we light what is called the shepherd's candle, also known as the candle of joy. And again, it's time for us to remember who the shepherds were, but what they were like as well. So join me in prayer. God, I just ask that we may be like these shepherds. May we remember what it means to just be excited about the good news, to have joy over the birth of this Savior of Christ, to put everything on pause and to run to you, to have this, this, expect, this expectant anticipation and wander as we gaze upon you. God, may we experience that anew this year, this, this week in Advent. And we ask this in your name.
strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven, come.
Father, during this Advent season, we reflect in this moment of anticipation. We come waiting. And in this active participation of waiting, let us not grow weary. Let us not grow fearful. There are many unsettling and distracting events around us, both in this world and in our own lives. Help us not to fear, for fear robs us of knowing your joy. Fear keeps us from knowing your peace and your hope. Open our hearts and eyes to the great wonder of this season. Strengthen our faith in these moments. May we overcome all that keeps us from knowing your joy. Amen.
song as we look forward uh, to Jesus coming not just in remembrance of when he came in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago but as um, we look forward to him coming again and it will be on that day when tears will be right wiped away where there'll be no more suffering and pain where the empty will be filled God you will bring new life not just spiritual life, but physical life, as you bring together heaven and earth in a way we could hardly even imagine. So God, in this space of already there, because you've come in the person of Jesus to launch this kingdom, but in that space of not yet, we wait and we anticipate. We lean in and look forward to God, what you want to do, not just out there, but in us as well. God, that you would birth Christ in us and through us in a new way during this season. So God, thank you for this space, this time, for each person here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, at this time, we have the opportunity to go ahead and dismiss our children through junior high. So if you would stand up, children, and the rest of you, if you would go ahead and uh, put out a hand, and we are going to read this special Advent blessing that we have. So put a hand out to our children. Children of Monta Vista, Monta Vista Chapel, Chapel, in this, in this season, season of, of Advent, Advent, may you live in the, in the hope that, that is ours in Christ Jesus. May you experience the abiding peace of the Holy Spirit and be filled with abundant joy that is yours through God's great gift, Emmanuel. As you go, may you know the deep, deep love that God has for you. So go ahead and you are dismissed. If you are new, you can follow your children out. And Ashley or one of the children's ministry volunteers would love to kind of let you know what's happening and uh, help you sign them up. Look at all of them go. I just every time we do this, I am so grateful for our children's ministry. Yes. And uh, it's just a beautiful thing. So thank you so much for all of you who serve uh, in this way. Well, this morning I have uh, the distinct privilege to um, introduce our uh, preacher for today, and that is my wife, Michelle. 
Um, those of you may not know, uh, Michelle, though she is a realtor by day, uh, <laughs> she has also received, um, you can come on into the light over here. Uh, she has also um, received her master's uh, in ministry and biblical studies and formation from Portland Seminary. And so, um, you know, I'm always struck by when Michelle preaches, somebody will say, well, you know, did, did that come from something you said? And I always want to reverse it and say, no, most of the things I preach comes from <laughs> her. And so uh, it's a sweet space uh, to be able to share a passion for Christ. And so, um, Michelle, welcome, Michelle. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. I have a practice that I love to do, so I'm going to do it right now. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. It's one of my favorite things to do, especially during Christmas time, because taking a hymn or a Christmas carol out of its kind of context a little bit, out of its rhythm of melody, somehow I hear it different, and it's more meaningful. And this Christmas carol really fits our story this morning, because this morning we will be journeying to joy. And before we begin, we need to take a moment to understand a very important word within it, and that word is exile. If someone's living in exile, they're living in a foreign country because they can't live in their own country, and that's usually because of political reasons. To be in exile is to be displaced and unsettled without a place to call home. And our passage this morning in Isaiah finds Israel displaced, unsettled, in exile, longing for a place to call home and longing for deliverance. You see, the Israelites were absolutely clear as to why they were in exile. It was because their sin brought them there. For the Israelite, sin and exile were inextricably linked. In fact, we see that in Isaiah 64 where the Israelites were crying out to God and they were saying that their sin was so deep that they wondered if God would ever come near to them again. Would they ever see his mercies? Would he withhold his favor forever? They worried that they were on the outs with God. Israel was lost in their sin. They were hoping that God in his grace would show up and somehow bring them home. And I'm wondering if you've ever felt that way, thinking you're on the outs with God, knowing probably your sin got you there, and hoping that somehow a little grace will show up and lead you home. I think we've all felt that way, haven't we? I know I have. You see, the story of God's people leading up to this point is an interesting one. It ebbed and it flowed a bit. If they lived according to his good ways, then they thrived and the world around them thrived too. But when they disoriented from God, in other words, when they sinned and lived according to their own ways, because that's what sin is, then they found themselves far from God, separated from the blessings associated with God's favor, removed from their promised land and subject to those more powerful than they and enslaved to their whims and their demands. In other words, sin had its price, and that price was exile. And exile is both a social reality and a spiritual reality. They were in Babylon captivity because political power shifts happened and an oppressive foreign government took over. But they were also in captivity because they were disoriented from God and their sin brought it on. But then Isaiah comes along and he brings good news to the discouraged Israelites. So let's take a peek at that. It's found in Isaiah 61 beginning in verse one, and here is what the prophet says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, and they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor, They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Wow. And while this is really good news, what does it really mean? In the passage that we just read, Isaiah said that the Redeemer would come and preach good news to the poor. Why? Well, frankly, because the social systems favored certain people groups. It was a system of favoritism that created poverty by overlooking the needs of some and padding the pockets of others. But then spiritually speaking, good news to the poor also does not leave out the poor in spirit, meaning the morally bankrupt person who, like the Israelites, turned away from God and found themselves in a bad situation. Grace was showing up to take them both home. Good news means two things, hope for the morally bankrupt and hope for those who are held down by a social system of physical poverty too. But Isaiah also tells us that the Redeemer would bind up the brokenhearted. Why? Well, frankly speaking, turn on any news channel these days and the broken broken realities of a raging world are everywhere, aren't they? Physical and emotional wounds lie open, untended, and neglected in the streets. Can you imagine in your own suffering if you heard someone is coming to bind up your wound and stop the onslaught of injustice and make things right? What would it be like for the Israelite in Isaiah's day or the people in Gaza or the families of the Israelites taken hostage by Hamas to hear that someone is coming to deliver them from this nightmare and heal their wounds? Rebuild their cities. Because that's what it means to bind up the brokenhearted. And then why in verse 2 does Isaiah say that the Redeemer will comfort those who mourn? Well, maybe by now it's kind of obvious, but where there is suffering, there is mourning. We might prefer to keep our distance from suffering. Sometimes I think we think suffering might be contagious, so we want to like keep our distance from it. I know I do sometimes, but to suffer with someone means to become present with their pain, and that's hard, isn't it? That's hard, but it's necessary. In truth, if I'm honest with you this morning, I've only learned to be with others in their pain as I've experienced my own, and I've learned something in that, that words are rarely necessary, and I can imagine that that's why the Redeemer came to stay close to the ashes of grief until they became a garment of praise. That's the power of presence in suffering. But exile can take a lot of forms, maybe forms that maybe aren't directly connected to our sin. It can mean people living without shelter or food, children and families sleeping in cold houses, It happens when we use our resources to gain a leg up at the expense of someone else. By the way, that's actually not God blessing you. (laughs) Your blessing doesn't ever amount to somebody else's shaft. That's just an advantage, but it's not necessarily a blessing. So sometimes we we put people in exile just by our own actions. Exile can also mean a life season change that leaves us feeling displaced and unsettled and looking kind of for our footing. I recently drove by the home that Ken and I first owned, and I remember walking our son back in the day, almost 28 years ago, walking him down these beautiful tree-laden streets. I remember seeing my dad play with him in the front yard, my parents and us sitting on a blanket playing with the dog. Oh, man, they were good days. And as I turned the corner down one of the streets, I began to ache for those days to come back. They were simpler. And those I loved were still here. But life changed. And to be honest, 
I'm still looking for my footing. And it feels a little bit like exile. But bigger yet, exile can mean parents losing children and children losing parents. It means life is not as we want it. It's not how we planned it. And it's nowhere close to what we imagined. It means groaning for home. And that is why the prophet declares, this is also the year of the Lord's favor. Because better days are coming. Better days are coming. And it wasn't lost on our prophet that the stress and the fatigue of waiting in exile can make a person angry. In fact, I I think exile is a breeding ground. When you really think about it, exile is a breeding ground for anger, especially when it happens through a sense of injustice, right? Can you feel that? Those sense, that sense of injustice, something occurs that we either watch or we experience ourselves and our heart can become angry. But anger only makes exile worse. Anger robs both our resources and our dignity. It tears at the social fabric of any society and it poisons the heart of those who harbor it. In fact, if we're not careful, we ourselves will become the very thing that we are against. And so we must trust the abundant resources of God's thriving kingdom when we are waiting for justice to arrive. Trusting God, trusting that he will make things right, that will empower us to lay down the instruments of anger and to live into justice and mercy, to learn the ways of healing and forgiveness. This is a hard truth, isn't it? Because we all have something that we hold on to that we don't want to release. But unprocessed anger almost always is self-destructive. I I wonder if I can even take the word almost out of that. Unprocessed anger is always destructive. Remember, unforgiveness, this may be a familiar phrase to some of you, unforgiveness is the poison that you and I drink hoping someone else will die. So we have to find a way to lay down our instruments of anger and be a people of healing, of hope, of forgiveness. And I wonder if that's why the prophet promised that it was a year of the Lord's favor, but only a day of reckoning. Because exile gives us many reasons to be angry, but we can't live there. It only makes exile worse. And unless we think that in forgiveness that there will be no justice, I think we can rest assured that God's promises are true. We just sang about it. He will set the captive free. He will release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. He will rebuild the cities. He will bind our wounds. There is a day coming, according to the prophet Amos, when justice will roll like a river and righteousness like a never-ending stream. And we can trust that God will make all things right. That is the God that we serve but like the longing that I felt driving past my house. In exile, the Israelites longed for their glory days. They remembered a time when life was so much better than it is right now. If only we had our political leader back. If only our king would rise in triumph, then our suffering would be over. They thought if they could regain their position of influence and authority, all would be made right. But if they leaned too hard in the direction of a triumphant king, they would overlook their morally bankrupt heart, wouldn't they? And if they simply asked for forgiveness, then they would overlook the the social impact of their sin and ignore their responsibility to partner with the spirit to create a thriving society. They needed both freedom and forgiveness. And you know what? So do you and I. We need both freedom and forgiveness. And Advent is the celebration of God keeping his promises of deliverance for both. Within the entire book of Isaiah, 
God offers hope that deliverance would come first through a future king, that God will one day return in glory. But at the same time, the prophet also speaks of the suffering servant of the Lord through whom his people will be restored and redeemed. It's a both and. And then in our chapter today, we see a coming together of both the king and the ruler and the comforting servant. It's a social solution and it's a spiritual solution, both freedom and forgiveness. And as the people of God prayed for him to rend the heavens, to break through the veil that separates heaven and earth, and don't we all pray that sometimes? They clung to the promise that God the Father would send a royal servant empowered through the Spirit to bring about the deliverance that he promised, but... True deliverance would not come in the form that they expected. They wanted a king through whom the world would be set right. And I suppose that's long been the human condition. There's lots of examples leading up to this where the Israelites wanted a king to make things right. In fact, back in Judges, a man named Gideon delivered the Israelites from oppression. And when he did, the people wanted to make him king. And Gideon's response is, whoa, 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 (laughs) wait a minute. If I'm king, then God won't be. And he passed on the offer. And I think that's, that was true in Isaiah's day too. And frankly, if we're honest with ourselves, it's true in ours. People on both sides of the political aisle refer to their candidate in almost messianic tones, relying on things as if An election could set all things right, but right in whose direction? You see, relying on an earthly king will render render us morally bankrupt every time because we will disorient. It's the same thing that Gideon told the Israelites. If I'm king, then God won't be. When we rely on these earthly things, then we will disorient from God and we will, we will trust the wrong power. Gideon knew what the prophet Isaiah knew, that Israel was prone to wander away from God and toward their own interests. And true deliverance comes from the Spirit of God I'm going to say this again. True deliverance comes from the Spirit of God as it redeems the heart of man. And through that redeemed heart is built a redeemed world. And it simply can't happen any other way. We redeem, God redeems the heart of man. And through our redeemed heart, we partner with him to build a redeemed world. So hundreds of years later and many exiles later from seemingly out of nowhere, In the Gospel of Luke, a local carpenter's son, standing among the people of God at worship, reads the words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in a synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Hundreds of years passed between the words of the prophet Isaiah and the reading of Luke 4, and I imagine the people of God recited that passage many, many, many times. But this was the first time that they heard today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You see, Jesus boldly claims that he's the one through whom this Advent message is fulfilled, Emmanuel, God with them has come to ransom Israel at last. And since exile contains two realities, so must our deliverance from it. It is both social and it is spiritual. Jesus shatters the power of evil. In him is freedom from the bondage that holds us captive to a lesser life. But it wasn't accomplished through political triumph. It happened through suffering through someone who knew its pain and came near. Jesus' death and resurrection broke the oppressive forces of evil. 
In fact, there is no power or authority on earth greater than the power of the resurrected Jesus, even if, or maybe even because, it showed up in a lonely manger. Never underestimate the power of a redeeming God who suffered to come close to set his people, people free. Never, never underestimate. Because the anointed Jesus had every intention to break the patterns of injustice. Good news to the poor meant giving sinners and tax collectors a place at the table. It meant freedom from the captive like the indebted servant. It meant sight to the blind man and it meant the oppressed would be lifted out of their mire. Why? Because they were the ones who, try as they might, could not fix their situation. There were too many systems in place that kept them from being able to do that. So then Jesus, using Isaiah's word, proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this is interesting, and it's an important reference. What's happening here is he's referring to the year of Jubilee, when the land had been mortgaged, was returned to its owner, when debts were forgiven and Israelite slaves were released. We find it in Leviticus 25. But this was not met, missed at all on his hearers that morning in synagogue, because many families had lost land or were in debt because of hard times. And it was common for the wealthy to take the land in exchange for the debt. But when there was no land to give, well, then you had a problem. You were enslaved to that person until the debt was paid. Only most of the time it was an impossible debt to pay, so you remained in captivity. So can you imagine how those words must have felt to the one who needed that kind of relief? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would feel like to just have our own debt relieved? If someone just said, right? Oh man, that would, that would feel good. So Jesus brought a social deliverance, but he also brought a spiritual deliverance because in Jesus we find forgiveness. We find the grace needed to bring us back to God, back home to a thriving life. And forgiveness is the form that love must take in a broken world that is longing for restoration. So Israel's sin was so deep that they wondered, would they ever see God's mercy again? But here it is, showing up. Just as God had promised. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Have you ever wondered if you've overstepped the bounds of God's mercy or felt so trapped by your sin that you can't find your way through it? I know I have. God, I can't do this. Help. And you even kind of wonder if help's gonna show up. Like it almost feels like an empty prayer, doesn't it? Because it's overwhelming. We don't know how to get ourselves out of the situation and that's, when the Spirit of God opens our spiritually blind eyes and the darkness that is within us and around us is made light because Jesus is the source of light and life. And so Jesus offers both a social deliverance and a spiritual deliverance. But the Israelites' salvation really wasn't just for them because they are the oaks of righteousness, according to our passage. They're rooted and they're established in God's redeeming grace, and they're delivered not only like from something, but they're delivered to something. I mean, have you ever experienced something so good that you can't wait to tell somebody about it? You wanna just spread the good news? Well, the Israelites, according to Psalm 34, they had tasted and seen that the Lord was good. They were delivered into a vocation. They were intended to pass on the goodness of God and become a people through whom God could display his glorious riches and establish his good kingdom. In fact, the final verses of our Isaiah passage paint a beautiful picture of this. It says this, I, God, I love fair dealing and I hate thievery and crime. I'll pay wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. 
Your descendants will become well-known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people that I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul because he dressed me in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride who wears a jeweled tiara. For as the earth bursts with the spring flowers and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the master God brings righteousness into full bloom and he puts praise on display for all nations. Can you imagine that? Creation, you and I and all of nature aglow with God's goodness and love. Can you imagine a world like that? So I wanna ask a question. Where are you in exile? Where do you long for home? Where do you feel caught in your sin and you long to be set free from the grip of it? What is the thing that's keeping you from really thriving? An addiction? An offense? Anger? Be still for just a minute. Let the exile rise to the surface of your thoughts and of your heart. If you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. But be present with this. Sit with it. Feel it. Don't shy away from it. Pay attention to it. What is the exile that you hold in your heart. Maybe there's an exile that you watch and you see an injustice somewhere that troubles you during the week. Maybe God's inviting you to be an instrument of deliverance in that. But here's my next question. To whom are you looking for deliverance? Are you looking to yourself, to your own resources? Are you looking to a political leader, to another person? Because that's who the Israelites looked to and it only led to more exiles. So to whom are you looking for deliverance? And can I open, offer you the option of opening up your heart to the hope of Christ, to Advent, Emmanuel, God with you. Can you imagine it for a moment? See it, feel it, because he's here. Everyone in this room holds an exile somewhere within us, and God is here to meet us. He's here to sit with you until the ashes of its grief become a garment of praise. He is ready to redeem and deliver you. So let it be. Let it move in. Let it work its way through you. And Lord, let it be so. And so as we close this morning, I would like for us to say this together as both a blessing and a prayer to each other. You will know the words the minute I start to say them. Again, it's another carol, but it's so fitting. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king, and let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing because he rules the world with truth and grace, and he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Amen. So um, tonight we have an opportunity to continue this theme of putting into words that which we are longing for, that which we are hoping for, um, for the thing that we wait for in Advent. And so in the seatbacks in front of you, there are these little prayer cards. 
And um, I'm going to ask you to take one out right now. All of you just take one out. And I want you to put to words some of the things that God is putting on your heart to pray for. Where do you want deliverance? Where do you see in the world a place that needs deliverance? Where do we need Christ? Because tonight we're going to all come together. Um, and you're all invited to come. And we're going to simply pray uh, for some of these things. And you can put them with your name on if you'd like, and we'll pray specifically for you. Or you can put them anonymously. And, um, you know, God knows uh, who that's for. And some of them will be prayed for publicly up here. Some of them will be prayed for in small groups. And it's going to be prayed for by those of us who come back this evening between 5 and 6. Because the reality is, as Michelle said, um, those things we long for, like the only one who can ultimately bring them is Christ. We can try as we might on our own, but the reality is, like we need Jesus, don't we? We need God to move on our behalf. We need God to move on the behalf of our country. We need God to move on behalf of our families. We need God to move on behalf of the world. And so we're going to ask God to do that tonight. In humble trust, we're going to ask that. And if you like go, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't do this publicly ever. That's okay. Uh, come on out anyway, because um, it's going to be a simple, accessible thing for every single one of us. So I encourage you to come on out between 5 and 6 o'clock tonight and join us for this welcoming Christ into our world, a world that desperately, desperately needs Christ. So I'm going to give you a moment to go ahead and write, and then um, I'm going to ask that you either put them in the boxes at the exits, or there are baskets. There's two baskets, one on the, um, the welcoming, the information booth, and there is one um, right in front of the connection center, and you can drop them there. So I'm just going to give you one minute, and then uh, you can start to write, and if you need a little more time, you can continue to do that. But we would love to have um, specific things that we can be praying for this evening. So go ahead and take a moment and let that exile that Michelle talked about surface so that we can bring it to God. So like I said, you can drop those off in the connection boxes or there's some baskets out in the courtyard for you to do that. Um, and again, we invite you to come on back this evening between 5 and 6 o'clock and join us right here in the worship center for a time of prayer. Uh, I also want to remind you that next Sunday is Christmas Eve. And so we have two services on Christmas Eve, one at our normal time at 10 o'clock, and it's going to be the continuation of of this anticipating, and we're going to look at the story of the angel uh, telling Mary that she is going to give birth to a child. And then we're going to come back that evening at 7 o'clock for a candlelight service. It's going to be a, about a 45-minute service. It's open for absolutely everybody. Um, it's family-friendly. Come in your pajamas if you're already dressed in your pajamas, and uh, it'll be a sweet space. You can find that information out on the weekly. Also, as you head out uh, into the courtyard, not only will you notice those places to put the prayer cards, uh, but you're going to notice that there is a table that has some sewing products from our Afghan uh, ministry where we help uh, Afghan women learn how to sew so that uh, they can um, make a little bit of uh, money for their families. And then also we have the Monta Vista Chapel farm table, and I noticed it is completely overflowing, so please take that stuff home with you. Um, it's uh, meant to be shared so that uh, we all have something to bring home. So would you stand with me, and we are going to go ahead and close with a benediction. So now to him who is able, 
to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And don't we need him? Yeah. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forever. Go in God's peace. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. If you would like prayer, I just want to invite you to come on up. There will be some elders here, and they would love to be able to pray with you.